This is one of the many faces of AIDS. This is what AIDS can look like. I have AIDS. I was given an AIDS diagnosis 12 years ago. This is what it can look like. It can look like your mother. It can look like your father. It can look like your sister, your aunt, your grandmother, your best friend. It doesn't necessarily look like something. There was a time that it did. You know, like you could look at someone, say, 15 years ago on the streets in your circle and go, whoa, that person is really sick. Severe emaciation, KS lesions on their body, and really, really, really sick. And you would see and you would know that that person probably had AIDS and that person was sick, that person was dying. This is what it can look like. So, for the person that's out there that thinks, oh no, they don't have AIDS, look at them. They, they look totally healthy, they look good. I'm cool, we don't have to use the condom. It doesn't look like anything anymore. Not in your circles anyway. You know, you, there are hundreds of AIDS hospices that you can still go to and see people that near death, dying every day. I just read an, uh, a, an amazing article on this woman who just showed up at the end stages of AIDS, 2011, because she didn't know that that's what she had, and walked into the doctor's office, and they immediately took her to um, Joseph House in Washington, D.C., because that was all that they could do for her, because it was just a matter of time. There was, you know, she was so far advanced. This is what AIDS can look like. You know, I travel all around the world, and people still ask me today, um, on, on a pretty regular basis, if I get HIV, though, can't I just take those meds like Magic Johnson takes and, and I'll be cool, I'll be cured, right? Just take those meds. First of all, there is no cure for AIDS. The meds that Magic Johnson is taking is not a cure for AIDS. It is to slow the progression or to fight it at many different levels, uh, whether it's to stop it from penetrating the cell, whether it's to stop it from, you know, root replicating, you know, that this is what the meds do. You know, it is, it is chemotherapy in a pill, if you will, okay? We take chemotherapy every single day for the rest of our lives. And sometimes our virus becomes resistant to that chemotherapy, and we have to go on a different kind of chemotherapy for HIV. So that's all the, the cocktail for HIV is. But can't I just take those meds like Magic Johnson takes and I'm gonna be okay? So let's talk about that. Because you're talking to a woman now. I was diagnosed in 1989. <clears throat> By all rights, I shouldn't be here. Many of us didn't make it this long, you know? In 1989, the only drug that was out there and available to people with HIV was a drug called ACT. And it was before we knew how to properly administer the drug. And so I was taking, well, what we now know the proper dosage of AZT to be is one to two capsules per day. What we also know now today is that the AZT drug has actually changed, so it's not the same AZT, AZT drug that was given to us back then. You know, so it's, it's been um, reformed, if you will. And uh, refined, there you go, refined. Because of the severe complications that were being caused by these meds. So, one to two capsules per day, AZT. This was your treatment, that's it, that's all they can do for you. Drink this aloe juice, watch your diet, try to exercise, try not to slit your wrists, go team. AZT, I was taking six in the morning, six in the afternoon, and six at night. Every single day. And when I first went to this doctor, I remember it took me three months to get the appointment with the infectious disease doctor. And I thought, oh my God, this was after my diagnosis. I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna die before I get to see this doctor. I'm gonna, you know, and then I get in to see the doctor and I ask him, am I gonna die? He said, well, there's a chance you could live but there's a really good chance you are gonna die, but we're gonna keep you fighting for as long as we can. 
And I'm like, okay, ACT, six in the morning, six in the afternoon, six at night. And I became violently ill right away. First thing, you know, I, I can't hold anything down. I'm nauseous, I'm throwing it up. And then the diarrhea starts. I can't hold anything down and I can't hold anything in. And the next thing that happens is there's fiery nails that feel like they are being driven into my hands. It starts with one hand and then it goes, in, I mean, oh my God, it was so painful. It just felt like constant, oh, constant fiery nails being driven into my hand. It was like, drive it in and be on fire, drive it in and be on fire. And then it went to one foot. I was like, oh my God, this is so painful. And I remembered I took my mattress off of my bed and I put it right in between the bathroom and the kitchen so that in case a bout of vomiting or diarrhea came, I could hurry up and crawl to the bathroom and I could crawl to the fridge and open up the fridge and get my juices and stuff from the bottom shelf. And it started to really hurt to be able to hold anything, you know, so I had to figure out ways that I could hold things in order to be able to eat and drink. And even setting everything up on crawl level, if you will, because I didn't dare stand up most of the time because standing up was just a, it was just a cue to start throwing up. So I would keep everything on crawl level and even making sure that my house was ready to go in case I had to go. I can't tell you how many times I didn't make it on time to that bathroom. And I remember one time like it was yesterday, even though this is 1989, I remember it like it was yesterday. And I remember feeling like, oh, it woke me up. I was sound asleep and it woke me up and I thought, oh my God, I got to get to the bathroom right now because I'm going to throw up. And so I got on my hands and knees and I remember starting, you know, to walk on my hands and knees to get to the bathroom. And I got like three steps in, if you will. And all of a sudden I realized I'm not going to make it on time. And I start throwing up right there and it's like going all over my bed and I can't stop throwing up. And then that triggers the diarrhea. So now it's coming out of both ends and I'm like, oh my God, this is like, I just want to scream, but I'm like so sick I can't. So I just take the covers as soon as this is all over with, and I just turned them over, turned my pillow over, took my bottoms off, kind of wiped myself, and just tossed them away from me as, and curled back up into bed, cried, and went to sleep. And I laid there like that for another couple more days until I could get up and clean it up. So this was my life on AZT, and I called my doctor and I was like, I think, oh my God, this stuff happens so fast. You go and you test, you start taking pills, you get sick, you die, because that's what it felt like. It felt like I was seriously dying. I couldn't even get out of that bed half the time, you know? It's like, so I called him and I explained to him, you know, what was going on with me and whatnot, and so he said, you, you need to come in here right away. And I'm like, oh God, how am I gonna get there? I've gotta drive, no, I can't drive. Besides, if I drive, because I am so terrified that you're gonna find out that I'm HIV positive. I don't dare take my own car. Can you imagine me pulling into a doctor's office and somebody recognizing me in my car and saying, what are you doing here? I was like, I had so many different scary scenarios going on in my head. I was like, no way, you're not gonna find it. So I would get a cab. And I would have a cab drive me around downtown Los Angeles until I was just a couple of dollars shy of running out of money. Now for sure nobody's followed me. I'm paranoid. They dropped me off three blocks away from the hospital in the back and I would walk the back of the hospital and enter. Now remember, my feet are burning, my hands are burning, I'm nauseous, I'm like watching every step because this is really hard for me to get there. And we do a bunch of tests. And he says to me, you know, this is, this is drug toxicity. And I'm like, what? It's the first time I'm hearing of this, you know? I'm 22 years old, I don't know what this means. He's like, um, he starts to explain it to me. And I'm like, I hear, the drugs you're taking to live are making you sick. The drugs that are taking you are taking to live are making you sick, that's all I hear. I'm like, and I have to take these drugs, this is what's making me sick, and you're telling me, I have to keep on taking, I'm like, okay, so how long do I have, do I have to do this? You know, like, how long am I gonna live, doc? Because I wanna know how long I'm gonna have to do this for. I wanna know how much more time I have to go through this. And he's like, a year, maybe two? And I'm like, okay, a year, maybe two. 
and it's the drugs that are making me sick. This information I leave the hospital with, I stop in West Hollywood, which is what we call Boys Town in Los Angeles. I stop there to get some information at a bookstore because this is the, you know, the late 80s and this is a, what they're saying, a gay man's disease. This is an IV drug user's disease. So I go to get my information in Boys Town because that's where I can get the real information. So I pick up the AZT story, Poison by Prescription. Warn you, if you're taking AZT, don't read this book. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. It was originally um, made for cancer patients and the FDA said, oh no way are we going to um, allow this to go through because this drug here is gonna kill them before the cancer does. AIDS comes along, we got some AZT for you. Okay, great. Anyway, so I read this and um, I've got this information about having a year, maybe two, and the, how sick I am with the AZT and whatnot, and I got a case of the fuck it's. And you know what those are, right? You know? And I remember thinking this is not how I'm gonna live the last days of my life. I'm not gonna live here in my, my poopy pukey mattress. You know, I want, I, I've got a bucket list, and I'm damn sure gonna try to do as many of those things as I can in this amount of time. So, I couldn't function one day without thinking about having HIV. I couldn't function without thinking that I'm dying. I couldn't function without thinking, nobody's gonna love me ever again. I'm not gonna have children, I'm not gonna, you know, it was just, it was constantly there, you know, and that, was true of the time, you know, that's exactly what you were seeing on a daily basis. People were not living with this disease, people were dying with this disease. So I had a drink and I took the edge off of the, oh my God, I'm dying. It was just, I'm dying. A few more drinks, you're like, let's go to a club. I started self-medicating realize it then, but that's what I started doing. Having a few drinks a day turned into a lot of drinks a day and turned into, I didn't care what drug you had because I'm dying anyway, I'll try it. You wanna try, let's try it. Oh, you can't remember what it is, that pill in your pocket that somebody gave to you at the, at the rave last Saturday, but you still got two of them? Give them to me, I'll take them, I'll tell you exactly what they do. I didn't care, I didn't care anymore. You know, I was just like, just take away my pain, make me feel better. And my favorite drink in the entire world was more. Didn't matter what it was, just give me more. Yeah, I'll have more of that. That was good, I'll have more of that. Didn't matter. And of course, dumping all the drugs and alcohol and on top of an already suppressed immune system, I got very sick. Very, very sick. So we'll call the Becky who takes her HIV meds and has a plant-based diet, has meditation, exercise. I mean, I really take care of myself. I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't do drugs. I take my medication. I really take care of myself to the, you know, the case of the fuck it's, and that's the complete opposite where I didn't care. I didn't care. Didn't matter. It did matter, but I couldn't let anybody know that it mattered. So, when I got really, really sick the first time, I remember my head hurt really bad and I couldn't go to the bathroom, but it felt like I had to go to the bathroom. And so I remember going into the bathroom and weighing myself again, and now I'm down to 81 pounds. I weigh 155 right now, so 81, you can imagine, I wasn't looking too hot. And I, that, that particular morning, I woke up in a really, really soaking wet bed. And I thought, one of my friends is playing a trick on me, throwing water on my bed, how, how messed up is that? And then I realized, it's me. I'm having these high-pitched fevers that would spike. And you would just pour water out of your body. You could literally wring out my bed sheets. So after I got on the scale and I realized that the water in my bed is me and I'm like really delirious at this point and so I take my, I remember taking my temperature and it says that it's 104 and I'm like, 104, 
106 is death, so I'm still okay. I think 106 is death, so I'm still okay. I keep trying to convince myself that it's going to be okay, just hanging, you know, because this didn't happen overnight that I got that thin and that I got that sick, you know? So I sat down and I tried to go to the bathroom and because it felt like I always had to go to the bathroom but nothing would move. And I look down and I want to scream, but I don't because my head hurts so bad. And it's like, oh my God, this hurts so bad. And I have all of this blood and pus coming out of me. This alarms me. <laughs> so I pick up the phone and I call my neighbor across the street. My neighbor across the street, street thinks I have leukemia because I've thought a lot about it. Everybody at Playboy thinks I have leukemia. You know, this is some time into my diagnosis. And Leukemia is in the blood. Leukemia people embrace you. Leukemia people accept. Leukemia people still love you. HIV, not so much. I have leukemia. It was pretty easy to figure that one out, I'll tell you. So this is what my lie was to the world, that it was leukemia, except for the people that I had to tell. So. My neighbor across the street, I call him, I'm like, EJ, I'm really sick, I'm, I, I don't feel good. And, and, oh my God, I don't know how to dress myself. I don't know how to get dressed, EJ. I don't know how to get dressed. And so he came over, I'm sitting there, he throws clothes on me, puts me in the car, races me to the emergency room where I'm diagnosed with two brain infections. One they cannot give a name. One was cryptococcal meningitis. So that's why my head hurts so bad. And then I'm diagnosed with this um, severe, um, intestinal tract infection, because everything was going crazy, running amok, because my immune system was just completely gone. After that happens, I go, well, obviously it takes me some time to get well, I go back to my doctor and I'm like, you know, I just pretty much, I didn't even call him, I didn't show up for my next appointment, anything like that. So I go and I call my doctor and I'm like, will you please see me again? He's like. Rebecca, of course I'll see you again. I'm like, well, I just bailed on you. And he's like, yeah, I was wondering where you went. And I was like hoping, not the, I've been looking and hoping that wasn't, the, you know, what might happen. And so I went back in and I sat down with him and I said, I'll take the easy tea. I'm going to do it. I know what to expect now. I know what's in store for, I, I'm, I'm ready. I, will, I can do this. Let me do it. Because getting that sick scared the hell out of me. So. He said, well, Rebecca, you don't have to do the ACT. I said, I don't. He said, well, there's a new drug that's out. The FDA hasn't approved it yet, but we have it. It's called DDI. I'm like, okay, I don't believe it. None of this makes any sense to me. I don't hear FDA has not approved it yet. <laughs> I just go, give me, you know? And it's still in powder form. It hasn't even been put into the pill form yet, you know? So I am mixing it up every morning and drinking it and every night and drinking it. And gasoline tastes better. A lot better. So I'm back to really taking care of myself and whatnot. And my friend calls me. I had this um, Uber supermodel friend from another country, but her accent always changed. So I can never tell what country she was really from. You know those kind of supermodels? So, <laughs> but I loved her. And she seemed to always put the bill and take care of you, and, and she knew about me. I had told her that, you know, about the HIV and stuff, and so she was always concerned about me. And she said, Vicky, I'm going to go, like, shopping. I'm like, okay, come get me, we'll go shopping. Because the DDI, actually, I wasn't in the pukey poopy bed anymore. I could go shopping. It's cool. And um, she said, but I want, like, these boots, like, in Texas, like, cow I said, like, cowboy boots? She said, yes, like, cowboy boots. I'm like, okay, so let's. Go shopping for cowboy boots. She's like, no, I want to go to Texas for cowboy boots. I'm like, Fifi, we live in LA. She said, uh, and I want like these belts that you see like from Texas. Like, I mean, she, I said, Fifi. She's like, I buy a ticket for you go this afternoon. I'm like, okay, fine, we're going to Texas. <laughs> so she buys us tickets, we fly to Texas, we go shopping, we get different colored boots, different types of skin, not good for the vegetarian, but anyway. And, um, and then she's like, oh, I remember, I want to do this line dance. And I'm like, 
oh god, every bone in my body's cringing. I'm a punk rocker, not a line dancer. <laughs> but okay, we're going line dancing. And so I go to her, you know, go with her to this club, and I'm out there trying to learn how to line dance. You know, there's an action, you know. And it's fun. I'm having a great time. And out of nowhere, I'm hit in the side with this excruciating pain that takes the breath away. And I'm like, Thief, I'm going to go outside and get some air and get some water. And everything's going to, I'll come back in a little bit. And I walk, make my way through that crowded club. And as soon as I opened up that door to go outside the club, I fell flat on my face. And I started convulsing and regurgitating and convulsing and regurgitating. And my body would not stop. They called the ambulance and they took me to the doctors, to the emergency room in, in Texas. Great. I'm not even near my HIV doctor. And I remember the nurse not even putting on gloves. And I'm like throwing up and I'm like yelling for my friend to tell her to put on gloves, you know? Like in between throwing up and convulsing, like make her put on gloves, make her put on gloves. And um, they finally get a hold of my doctor who talks to um, this doctor and whatnot. And because I've sworn my friend to secrecy, to tell anybody. And so they work it all out and they figure it all out and they <clears throat> come to the fact, I end up spending a lot of time in Texas hospital because my pancreas has begun to rupture from the DDI. Now I'm pissed. That's two down. So now I go out on a rampage, if you will, or I, I don't even know what you want to call it. I just, I know I, part of it involved seeking shelter in that boy's town that I told you about. You know, I, I just wanted to be closer to someone, anyone who might be HIV positive. I would go and watch movies in West Hollywood. I would go to the bars that, you know, that there was, you know, 99% were men and then a couple of maybe two or three women couples, you know, it's like, but I knew that for some reason that made me feel a little bit more okay, a little bit more safe. Like maybe, maybe they knew who I was and what I was dealing with, even though I wasn't telling them. So I sought shelter in the gay community. And I went on a bender. I knew which bartenders would close out the bar and have the drug. They became my friends, and then the drugs just was like this co-factor. I was like, oh my god, dude, you like to do speed too? Cool. This is great. We'll stay up for the next two days. This is awesome because I'm dying, so I don't mind staying up for two, three, four days at a time. Because I'm going to be awake for it, right? And I had confided in my hairdresser, my hairdresser that I met at Playboy. He then opened up his own salon in Beverly Hills, West Hollywood adjacent, actually. It was Beverly Hills adjacent, which was West Hollywood. And, um, and so I started talking to him one day. So, you know, I'm getting really tired and I'm starting to get run down. You know, I'm doing a lot of drinking and I'm using a lot of drugs and, and I'm staying up days at a time. And I start talking to him about HIV and I've really educated myself at this point, even though I'm partying a lot, I've still got those books and I'm still reading. I'm, any article that comes out in the news, I'm reading, you know, I'm trying to, you know, understand what this is that's going on. I've seen Ryan White on TV and he's fighting to stay in school and hemophiliac kids in Florida are getting their house burnt down because they got that HIV and, you know, I'm staying on top of everything that I can possibly stay on top of. You know, I'm, I'm a sponge when it comes to HIV. And I start to tell Jean Daniel about HIV. He's talking to him about it. And he says, wow, Rebecca, it sounds like so you're so educated on HIV. It sounds like you know somebody, you know, with HIV. And I said, yeah, me. And he turned and he got in front of me and he said, me too. So I started to make friends, you know, and he started introducing me to other people that were HIV positive, you know, and so I was like, I was like, oh my God, I'm not alone. I'm not going to die alone, you know, I'm not dying alone. <laughs> <laughs> and it was this amazing thing that started happening, but I couldn't stop drinking and using, you know, because I was like, this was, these were my party buddies. This was, you know, this part of the lifestyle and whatnot. And, and 
Then I watched Jean get really sick. He lost his vision. And there was a church in, in uh, Hollywood, actually, not even West Hollywood. There was a church in Hollywood. And, and I didn't, you know, I wasn't so big on going to church, but I went to church with Jean and helped guide him down, you know, to go sit and with his lover and whatnot and, and uh, take him dancing, you know, so he could dance again before, you know, the end came and whatnot. And, and um, then he got the KS really bad, Kaposi sarcoma, and his legs were this bright, swollen purple color, and he could barely walk anymore, so we would have him on walkers and stuff, and we would take the party over to his house. He wasn't a druggie. He was like my, one of my friends that could have a glass of wine. I never got that. You can have a glass of wine? Who has a glass of wine? Give me a bottle or two, but a glass? I don't think so. And that's not the way I roll. And, um, so I would go over there and my little brother had moved in with me at this time and he was, you know, helping take care of me because I was starting to get sick. It was obvious I was really starting to get sick. And then, um, and then Sean died. And my little brother and I went to that funeral. And right after that funeral, the next night we went to another friend's get together. And it was my straight friend's get together, if you will. And we're sitting at the table and we're eating, my little brother and I with my straight friends, and they start telling gay jokes. And they start telling AIDS jokes. And I was like, oh my God, you know? I mean, they weren't pretty, it's not nice. You know, and, I'm, and my brother looks at me and he's like, he's like turning white. He's like, oh my God, you know? He's like, what do we do? And I'm like, and I elbow him like, Joke. <laughs> he starts laughing, and so we're laughing at the AIDS jokes together with my straight, dumb friends. And I was like, I'm sick of this ignorance. I'm sick of what I'm hearing, you know, by people that just don't know. Not that they're an ignorant person, but they're not getting the information that they need in order to not make AIDS jokes or not make gay jokes. And. Then came around a weekend where I went to three funerals on one weekend. And uh, I kid you not, I watched each and every single one of my friends die. So it was a blessing to get these beautiful, wonderful friends that were there that I could confide in and we could discuss our drugs that we were taking for HIV, and we could talk about the aloe vera juice that we were drinking, and we could talk about the guys who went downtown underground to go and get those injections, and it was really bleach. You know, it was like, this was a gnarly time, and then it was like, and, and everybody's dying, now you guys are all dying, and I, that's it, I had enough, and that's when I decided to take my own life. I wasn't going to let anybody change my diaper like I changed Ed's diapers. I wasn't gonna, you know, besides that, I didn't think I deserved that. I didn't think I was good enough for you to take care of me. I didn't, you know, I was that dirty, nasty girl who got AIDS, you know. I, I'm yucky, you know. Why would you want to help me? That's inside what I felt like all the time, you know, just blah. So I ended up in a coma after um, all the drugs and driving the car into the brick wall. And when I came out of that coma, first of all, when you OD and drive a car into a wall and wake up three days later, you hurt. Oh my God, it's like, my hair hurts. It was like, everything hurts. And <clears throat> I remember after, you know, several weeks in the hospital and getting better that I turned to my brother via the telephone and I said to him, I said, I want to, I think I want to go public. And he said, let's do it. Let's do it. I was like, okay, let's do it. And within three weeks, they were giving me my AIDS diagnosis and telling me to call my family and you know make your arrangements. I was like, why is this happening this way? So this was, I'm ready to go public. I'm ready to make a difference in my life. I, I wanted, I, my thought was I would go public and I would go into women's clinical trials because trials weren't being done on women. They were being done on men and not, and I actually had a friend that died 
because the treatments weren't tested on women who are obviously different than men. And so I'm like, I, I'll give, give myself the science, if you will. I know that sounds very, but you know, I got to do something with whatever's left here. And now you're telling me that there's no time to even do that. So I wasn't really happy with that. But obviously I got better. I'm a fighting fool. <laughs> This is when I go on what's called a uh, my first cocktail, and I'm thinking, oh great, something else I get to drink. And um, he's like, no, Rebecca, you know, you don't drink this one. He said, this cocktail is a combination of three or more drugs, usually prescribed together to fight the virus. And I'm like, okay. So I go on my first cocktail, and one of the drugs in it was a drug called Virocept. And with Virocept, I was. Well, let me just paint you the picture. I'm sitting there writing, because now I'm documenting every stage of my life, because wow, I wasn't supposed to make it this far. You know, so I'm writing, dear diary. And uh, I'm, you know, any little scab or wound, I'm like, oh, we should uh, document that. It looks like no odor. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm like becoming like really, you know, insane with this stuff. I'm gonna tell everybody every little detail. And without warning, it just happened. And I'm like, oh my God, panic mode. I run to the bathroom, I clean myself up, I get on the phone, not even thinking about what it is I'm gonna say. And the doctor comes on the phone and I said, I just pooped my pants. And he's like, she, it's a female doctor at this time. And she said, don't worry, Rebecca, that's, that's just the virus set. And I'm like, oh, that's just the virus set, great. No one just shit myself, great. <laughs> So I, next 18 months of my life, I lived with, that's just the virus set. And this is at the same time that I'm going through all those, uh, all of the, um, I developed thrombopedia, wait, thrombo, <laughs> why am I drawing a blank? Uh, you, you guys can probably imagine it's the pond. <laughs> ITP for short. And what it is, is that your, your blood won't coagulate. Okay. Does anybody know what ITP stands for? Oh my God, I hate when that happens. Okay, like I'm totally blonde right now. Okay. Um, so I developed ITP, which meant that my blood wouldn't coagulate, and that's why I was bleeding out. So I, I was bleeding out literally at my anus, out of my out of my ears, out of my nose, out of my mouth, any orifice that I had, it would start bleeding out. So this is what was happening. And um, and at the same time, I'm, you know, you have to watch out because you never know when that virus set might happen. You know, so I can't, like, I have to be prepared when I leave the house. I gotta make sure I know where the clean public restrooms are, et cetera, et cetera. And my friend is documenting everything, you know? So that's why I said you didn't see some of the stuff because some of the stuff was just really too gnarly. You don't wanna see some of the stuff. And um, I remember driving with her because she took me back and forth to my doctor's appointments. And um, it's the middle of winter in New England. And that's just the virus that happens. It's about to happen. I can tell now when that's just the virus that is gonna happen. And oh my God, Tina, you gotta pull over, you gotta pull over, you gotta pull over. She's like, well, I can't pull over, there's six feet of snow bank there. What am I supposed to do? She's like, hold on, I'll, I'll, I'll just hang on, I'll get us there, I'll get us there. And I'm like, too late. Because that's just the virus that just happened. And she, we're rolling this hand crank windows, rolling down the windows, got her head hanging out the window. She's like, it's okay. I'm like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. She's like, it's okay, we'll just get there really fast. <laughs> Not nice. And um, when I got home, I remember running up the stairs and it's made its way down my legs and into my shoes, so I'm squishing with every step as I make it up into the shower and I clean myself up, come back down to the car, so we clean up that mess, you know, I do. And um, she says, what do you think about, I'm like, what do I think about what? You know, I'm pissed, yeah, I'm not, I'm not having a really good day, Tina. She said, what do you think about, you know, I'm like, pads? We're doing the pads. I'm, I'm going through the pads. She's like, I know for the blood, but what do you think about diapers? I'm like, diapers. I'm like, okay, you're onto something here. This could be cool. I said, but if I'm doing it, you're doing it. <laughs> She's like, I'm in. So we go to the store and we look through the adult diaper section. We knew there were so many to choose from. I'm like, shit, now we got like 
focus, focus, focus. <laughs> All right, so we pick a couple of different ones, and we go back. Now it's winter time, remember, and it's New England, so we put another log in that uh, wood-burning stove of ours there in the living room. We pop it in that movie, and we're wearing just our diapers and hoodies with our bowl of popcorn. <laughs> Of course, she ain't gonna have just the virus set, but I will, but she has to participate. So, <laughs> that's just the virus set. I'm like, it's on. She's like, it's on. I'm like, it's on. She's like, do it, do it, do the diaper dance. So we had this little dance that we did, you know, shaking it around, I ran up the stairs, ran back down, until I finally figured out which diaper worked best for me. <laughs> so now I'm living my life in diapers, you know, but I get to go to the mall now, which is pretty cool. You know, do you ever get like at the mall and you're at one end of the mall and the only bathroom for some reason is on the complete opposite end of the mall? And you're like, oh shit, that, well think about it when you just that's just the virus that happens. You're like, <laughs> I got hurry. So now I don't have to worry because I'll just change my diaper. I got a diaper bag, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so the virus set. Sorry about that. The virus that finally, um, my virus, my HIV became resistant to the virus that and started eating it like candy and it no longer worked. <coughs> so I had to go on to my next new drug, which for me was pretty evil. It was Crixivan. And cri with Crixivan, I'll, I'll shorten it up here. Crixivan for me, I developed raw open sores all over my body to where I couldn't wear anything that wasn't light and flowy and airy, you know? And even then, I would be terrified that somebody might touch me, and I'd be like, don't touch me, I'll kill you. And my hair started falling out, and I couldn't go to the bathroom to save my life. And I remember, you know, I'm still documenting everything. Dear diary. Day four, no BM. Day eight, no BM. Better call the doctor. I'm like pushing it and pushing my luck here. Oh, and by the way, the Crixivan causes kidney stones, so you need to drink at least a gallon of water a day. And all of my mucous membranes at this point are dried, cracked, and bleeding, and I have to go urinate. Girls, you can relate, right? Can you imagine that thing is dried, cracked, and bleeding, and you have to pee on it? Ah, and I'm peeing a lot. Ah, and I had these big cracks, wide open cracks here in the corners of my mouth. And I was like, oh my God, everything hurts. My hair's falling out. I don't look pretty. I'm too vain for this shit, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it really was not feeling good. And I was like, okay. So I go to this, oh, I called the doctor about the, you know, no BM thing. And she said, oh, you just need to get yourself some colace. And I'm like, English, like English. She's like, um, stool softener. I'm like, ah. <laughs> so, I'm just kidding, but I really didn't know what colace was. I'm like, colace, what's colace? I don't have a cold. Um, what's colace? So, I go to the store and I get the x lax and I come home with it and I read the directions and I'm like, Shh, okay. So, eight days, I was that time eight. Yeah, uh huh, I did. I took eight days worth in one because I thought that's what I should do. <laughs> because I was so uncomfortable. I just wanted it out of me right away. And I'm like, I'm like, it's gonna, it's, yeah. Oh boy, that was fun. That was actually really insane because it started bubbling and gurgling and I was like, oh, I don't feel so good. And it felt like it was up to here, you know, my belly was out to here and I was like, oh my God, I gotta go to the bathroom. And, and I sit down. And it just comes out of me. It's like this explosion. And I'm not sure whether or not I'm going to shit or throw up because it's like the sweat is pouring. I'm like, oh my God. It's, uh -oh. Woo. Anyway, so what I had to do was I needed to go and learn how to um, give myself an enema because the Crixivan was making everything in my body hard and drying me out. And I'm telling you, I was like in pain. And so this is how my week went Monday, stool softener, Tuesday, take a break Wednesday enema. Thursday, stool softener, you know, that's how it went. So I had to learn how to give myself enemas. And I had to do enemas once or twice a week in order just to keep myself moving through. And um, I remember my doctor calling me one day and this, I, I'm telling you guys, I have like barely any hair. I have really, really bloody open sores all over my body. And it's like, 
and I'm bleeding out because I'm hemorrhaging and I was like, oh my God, this is like so painful and I can't even go to the bathroom. And she said, you know, Rebecca, I was looking over your chart and I think that maybe the Crick's is just a little too toxic for you. You think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so too. <laughs> so what's next, doc? You know, I'm like, stay with it. Let's keep going. You know, I, I was um, on to my next endeavor. So I went on to my next drug, and that drug was pretty amazing. That drug lasted for eight years, and I thought it was the greatest drug of the world. Wait, seven, eight years, eight years on that drug.